Thank you and good morning. Can you hear me okay in the back of the room? Yes. Better? Okay. Questions about Holocaust memory date back to the time of the persecution and mass killings themselves. From the standpoint of the perpetrators, the genocide of the Jews was to be an unrecorded or silent crime, an unwritten and never to be written page of glory, as Heinrich Himmler put it in a famous speech he delivered in Poznan in October 1943. From the standpoint of the intended victims, the brutal persecutions, expulsions, and murders, far from being a source of glory, were a cause of deep anxiety. Jews in Nazi-dominated Europe feared not only that they would be slaughtered in large numbers, but also that there would be no lasting record of their violent end. Looking back decades later, the Nazi camp survivor and Nobel laureate Imre Kertes recalls, and I quote him, from the very first moment when it was far from being revealed to the world, when it was as yet unnamed, from the very first moment there was a terrible anxiety, a fear of forgetfulness attached to the Holocaust. To counter forgetting, historians have labored for decades to document, describe, and explain the history of the Third Reich and the Nazi campaign of oppression and elimination of subject peoples, the Jews foremost among them. Their work has been invaluable. And yet, historical memory broadly conceived may depend less on the record of events drawn up by scholars than on the projection of these events by writers, filmmakers, artists, architects, museum designers, TV producers and directors, and others. A review of these productions shows that Holocaust memory has long been a volatile area of contending images, interpretations, historical claims and counterclaims. Far from being fixed, Holocaust memory is continually in flux, and that's increasingly so within our universities. Some proponents of genocide studies, for instance, decry ongoing attention to the Holocaust as being too narrow or too parochial. They argue that it's time to insert study of the Nazi crimes against the Jews into the broader comparative frameworks of their discipline. For instance, Mariana Hirsch of Columbia University and her colleague Irena Casandes, the editors of the book Teaching the Representation of the Holocaust, argue that because scholars who teach the Holocaust in the United States do so as part of what they call, and these are their words, a people with its own troubled history of suffering, persecution, and genocide, an acknowledgement of the relation of Holocaust representation and memorialization to the representation of slavery and Native American genocide is fundamental to any Holocaust course taught in the United States. In support of their argument, they cite the work of the historian Eric Weitz, who maintains, and I quote Professor Weitz, on the larger canvas of school and university curricula and of research, the singular focus on the Holocaust no longer suffices. Why it no longer suffices is never made clear. Scholars who offer courses on American slavery and the fate of Native Americans, after all, feel no obligation to focus their curricula along comparative lines, but treat their subjects as fully sufficient unto themselves. 
but if they are right to do so, and I contend they are, why is a focus on the Holocaust suddenly deemed to be insufficient? And why is there a supposed need to encompass study of the Nazi crimes against the Jews within an American context that will expose students to what Hirsch and Cassandes call the workings of racism and prejudice that we can find within our own culture. Racism and prejudice are well-established facts of American national life, but to date they've not culminated in anything remotely like Auschwitz or Treblinka. To situate study of the Nazi crimes against the Jews within a specifically American framework, therefore, risks distorting the histories of both the Nazi Holocaust and the American experience, including the experience of racism. The imperative to reorient Holocaust studies in this way is but one illustration among many of a growing impatience with the place of the Holocaust in contemporary life, which mirrors similar, even more strongly expressed feelings of dissatisfaction with Holocaust history and memory in parts of Europe and throughout the Muslim world. Numerous professors today argue, wrongly I believe, that Holocaust studies by awarding supreme victim status to the Jews, deny it to other victim groups, and thereby assign what they call a permanent privilege to the Jews alone. They are inclined to engage Holocaust history and memory polemically, claiming that it's part of a Zionist scheme to make Israel the beneficiary of universal sympathy through an exclusive concentration on Jewish suffering during the Nazi era. Moreover, Jews today are said to use their own past history of suffering as a pretext to inflict sufferings on others. In the name of Auschwitz, it's repeatedly alleged Jews are actively carrying out a genocide of their own. To put an end to such alleged Jewish chauvinism, it is argued, it's time, in the words of one of these scholars, to end Auschwitz. Or as the influential French philosopher Alain Badiou puts it, the time has come to forget the Holocaust, and that's a direct quote from Badiou. Forgetting the Holocaust is precisely what growing numbers of people seem intent on doing. Recent public opinion polls show that 44% of people in European countries think that Jews continue to talk too much about the Holocaust. In three of these countries, Austria, Poland, and Hungary, the figure is even higher. In another poll, 42% of people in eight European countries believe that Jews exploit the past of their suffering to extort money. The implications of these findings are clear. A sizable part of the European population has heard all they want to hear about the tribulations of the Jews. They've grown tired and resentful of having to confront yet again stories of Jewish victimization and suffering, and they want to move on. Examples abound. Here's one of them. The seventh Berlin Biennale, a major art show that opened just last month in Germany's capital, included a film by the Polish artist Artur Szmiewski entitled Berek, meaning tag. The film shows a group of smiling naked people playing a game of tag 
in the gas chamber of a former Nazi concentration camp. They look like they're having a good time. The artist comments, the murdered people are victims, but we, the living, are also victims. And as such, we need a kind of treatment or therapy. Instead of dead bodies, we can see laughter and life. The aim, the film director concludes, is to emancipate ourselves from the trauma, in this case, by transforming the site of the trauma, the gas chamber, into a place for lighthearted games. Thus, instead of the ghastly spectacle of naked bodies in the gas chamber piled on top of one another as corpses, they're seen frolicking with one another in exuberant play. It's this kind of instance and others like it that lead me to believe the end of the Holocaust is beginning to come into view. If not necessarily in the same way, others are also seeking to find relief from the oppressive nature of what they feel is an imposed and unwanted memory. As Lord Baker of Dorking, who served for three years as British Education Secretary under Margaret Thatcher, recently put it, and I quote his words, it's time to stop teaching British youngsters about the Holocaust. I would ban the study of Nazism from the history curriculum today. In certain French schools, such courses are no longer taught, seemingly because Muslim pupils object to them or act aggressively in the classroom when the subject is presented. And if a new ruling by officials in the French Education Ministry stands up, the very words Shoah and Holocaust are to be removed from school curricula and school textbooks for their connotations are judged to be too specific to the Jewish experience. Instead, a more generalized French word for annihilation is recommended. In the United States, many colleges and universities continue to offer courses on the Nazi persecution and destruction of European Jewry. But at some of these institutions, faculty members are under pressure to broaden the focus of what they teach and include other historical examples of mass violence as well. The idea is to avoid what's called a Jewish monopolization of suffering in order to broaden awareness of man's inhumanity to man in general. These same goals may account for the conversion of institutes originally conceived as centers for the study of the Holocaust to centers of Holocaust and genocide studies or Holocaust genocide and human rights studies or Holocaust genocide and peace studies, etc. As part of this trend, there's a tendency to see the Holocaust more as a universal symbol of human rights violations wherever these may occur and less as a crime that specifically targeted Jews. To be sure, the latter continues to be acknowledged, but chiefly for its emblematic value as a referent that can be extended to others. Thus, the Holocaust as a genocidal crime against the Jews becomes recontextualized into a series of moral lessons about problems of injustice that periodically beset humanity as such and is used didactically for teaching the lessons of human rights, tolerance, justice, and other socially progressive ideals. A major proponent of this view is the Yale sociologist Jeffrey Alexander. 
in his much discussed essay, The Social Construct of Construction of Moral Universals, Professor Alexander argues that whereas the Holocaust may originally have been known as a specific and situated historical event, it has in recent years become transformed into a generalized symbol of human suffering. He strongly affirms this development on what he regards to be moral and political grounds. In his view, the widespread adoption of the genocidal crimes against the Jews as an excessive metaphor for evil has created historically unprecedented opportunities for ethnic, racial, and religious justice, for mutual recognition, and for global conflicts becoming regulated in a more civil way. In short, in his view, through symbolic extension of the Holocaust as what he calls a bridge metaphor, the memory of the Nazi crimes can help advance the cause of human rights, human solidarity, and a greater degree of moral responsibility and justice worldwide. While it's hard to recognize in the real world a great deal of progress towards fulfilling these idealistic goals, Alexander is correct in noting that on a global scale, the Holocaust is being universalized as a moral political myth that can be readily appropriated by others who claim a history of victimization. The tendencies that I've been describing to you are part of the politicization of historical memory, a process whose turns with respect to the Holocaust can be and should be a cause for serious concern. That's especially so in the face of claims that too much attention to the Nazi Holocaust has resulted in too little attention to other victim groups and even other holocausts. In certain European countries today, most prominently, but not only in some of the Baltic republics, one finds a growing tendency to equalize the crimes of Hitler and Stalin and a call for the creation of new institutions and public ceremonies to jointly remember the victims of both dictators. The Prague Declaration on European Conscience and Communism of June the 3rd, 2008, for instance, sets forth a rationale for recognizing communism and Nazism as a common legacy and argues for reaching an all-European understanding that the crimes committed in the names of communism should be assessed and remembered in the same way Nazi crimes were assessed by the Nuremberg Tribunal. The Prague Declaration has been a significant spur for such thinking, and parallel proposals have been presented to the political bodies of other East European countries. The effect is to redefine genocide so that it will apply more broadly, if less precisely, to people other than the Jews. On April the 2nd, 2009, more than 400 members of the European Parliament voted in favor of setting aside August the 23rd, the date in 1939 when the Ribbentrop-Molotov Pact was signed between Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union as European Day of Remembrance for victims of Stalinism and Nazism. The eminent Israeli historian of the Holocaust, Yehuda Bauer, decries these developments, I think properly so. While recognizing that the many victims of Soviet tyranny 
should indeed be remembered through appropriate memorials and special commemorative events. Professor Bauer sees these moves towards equivalence as what he calls a mendacious revision of recent world history, which seriously distorts the character of both Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union, and trivializes and relativizes the genocide of the Jews perpetrated by the Nazi regime. He's joined by the Lithuanian philosopher Leonidas Donskis, who rues these developments within his own country and sees them as examples of what he calls a general rhetorical inflation and hence a devaluation of all concepts and values including the concept of genocide. Donskis concludes, and I quote him, whether we like it or not, attempts to rewrite the history of World War II by equalizing the fate of the Jews with that of other Europeans, seriously distort the reality of what actually occurred. His locution whether we like it or not, is revealing. For as he well knows, many of Donskis' fellow countrymen decidedly do not like it and are setting about to change the perception that the Jews and the Jews alone are entitled to special attention. Their counterparts elsewhere in Europe are doing the same. If they succeed, the particular features that define Nazi crimes against the Jews henceforth may be blended into some more generalized concept of totalitarian or tyrannical criminality. What might we conclude from these developments? Holocaust remembrance is sustained by multiple sources and it will not quickly fade. But it vies today with a range of contrary and often contentious sources that facilitate marginalizing, minimizing, distorting, and forgetting. In the brief pres presentation that I've just offered you, and I recognize that it's much too brief given the fullness of this topic, only, I've been able to give you only a small number of these. A fuller study would reveal that Holocaust fatigue and Holocaust resentment seem to be increasing. Many people, it now appears, have had enough of the Jews and their sorrows, and they want relief from all of that. Complaints about the hegemony of Jewish Holocaust memory and of a self-serving Holocaust industry are symptomatic of this changed mood. In sum, a number of signs indicate a growing dissatisfaction with the spread of Holocaust consciousness and point to a range of moves against it. How much influence such negatives reaction, how much influence such negative reactions are likely to have is impossible to predict. But if these trends continue unchecked, Holocaust memory may be less compelling and also less sustainable in the years ahead than it has been in years past. Thank you.